Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started now. My name is Eric Harris-Brown. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here hosting this session of the 2023 Schumacher, Schumacher Conversation Series. I have a long history with the Schumacher Center. It's an organization that's been pivotal in my life. Some 20 years ago, I participated in a Tools for Change seminar, not a webinar, an actual in-person seminar. That's what we were doing back then at the Schumacher Center. And that event served as a catalyst point in my life, shifting the course of it into focusing on the very topic of today's webinar. I'm a technologist dedicated to creating infrastructure that inherently supports decentralization by its nature so that it can be applied to problems like monetary issuance. For many years, I served on the board of the Schumacher Center, but now I'm just an advisory board member. So I'm really happy to have this opportunity to host these fabulous panelists while we keep moving forward this crucial conversation about how we all together can collectively evolve the social technology known as money. First, a little bit about the Schumacher Center itself. The Schumacher Center for a New Economics was founded in 1980. And since that time, it's been working on envisioning the elements of a just and regenerative global economy through the lens of decentralist thinking that E.F. Schumacher seeded in many ways, but especially in his book, Small is Beautiful. The Schumacher Center has been particularly important to me because throughout that whole history, it's taken the approach of both theory and action, which I think is critical. It's done so by taking that envisioned, those envisioned elements of adjusted regenerative society and a global economy and doing the hard work of successfully applying the theory locally in its home region of the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts. And then it follows up by developing educational programs like this one, the one we're a part of, to share those results and thus encourage replication. The Schumacher Center has also throughout its history been an extraordinary convener of thinkers and practitioners. My first experience on the board of, right after I board, joined the board, was diving into a conference that was called in, in 2004, that was called Local Currencies in the 21st Century, Understanding Money, Building Local Economies, Renewing Community. And that, that event was a seminal event bringing together a whole raft of early pioneers in the work of local currencies. This year, 2023, is a special year for the Schumacher Center because it marks the 50th anniversary of, e of E.F. Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful. Anniversaries provide moments to celebrate and to reflect in depth, so the center is using this opportunity to continue its pattern of convening by bringing together thinkers and practitioners who can help us reflect on how we advance solution that build, build, solutions that build on Schumacher's vision. So, on to today's conversation. Our theme is democratizing monetary issue, tools for resilience. In Small is Beautiful, Schumacher focused on the critical realization of local production for local needs. Say that again, local production for local needs. This is a first principle of thrivable life-affirming economics. Another of Schumacher's core concepts was one he termed appropriate technology, where appropriateness was about matching technology to the scale where it's applied. So our conversation today brings together those two ideas by celebrating people who are innovating and redesigning that most ubiquitous of technological tools appropriately, the one that has one of the most profound potential impacts to empower local production for local needs. And that is, of course, the social technology we call our monetary system. So today's dominant central currencies appear fixed. They feel immutable. Key decisions are made behind closed doors, out of reach of democratic accountability. But since 2008 and even earlier, we really see that this is being called into question. And we see that in the form of a flourishing global movement of regional currencies. Our panelists are really great representations of that. This fact and this process represents a democratization of monetary issuance. And it's a critical return to more localized systems of production and a means for enlivening citizens in the interdependencies of which our lives are based by being able to be in the conversation of that kind of tooling. So today's panelists are fabulous representatives of this conversation that the center holds so at heart. 
and they have deeply involved in innovating locally, educating globally on this issue and the role of monetary issuance. So we have with us today, and I welcome Christine Desan, Susanna uh, Martin Belmonte, and Will Ruddock. Um, Christine is a professor of law at Harvard Law School. She teaches political economy, the constitu constitutional law of money, and the international monetary system. Her research concerns money as a legal and political project. In her recent book, Making Money, Coin, Currency, and the Coming of Capitalism, she describes really interestingly how money isn't just a tool for measuring activity in a market, but actually turns out to reconfigure the market by its own design. This is a hint of what our whole conversation is about today. Susanna is an independent economist focusing on digitization of money for the transition to a fair and low carbon economy. She's trained in economic theory and has also led several monetary innovation products, including the REC Citizen Currency in partnership with the city of Barcelona. Will Ruddock, founder of Grassroots Economic Foundation is a development economist and practitioner focusing on curry currency innovation. Will has pioneered and successfully operated community currencies in Kenya since 2010, both by building the necessary technological and social infrastructure that's really hard to do and has had some amazing results in that. So let's continue with some opening remarks by our panelists. Um, in the order in which I introduce you, I'm asking you to please take 10 minutes or so to describe your vision for a more democratized, more thrivable monetary system and how your work contributes to bringing that into the world. Thank you for being here. And Christine, do you want to take it away? Yes, thanks. Thanks, Eric, for that intro. Um, and thanks to the Schumacher Center, Susan, David, and the staff for putting this together. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to share my screen first off and then use it to make a few points about money. Uh, let's see. How's that? Is that showing? Do we have uh, can Eric? Perfect. Can you, can you, yep. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, in the short time I have, I just want to make three points about money. Use each point to illustrate some uh, a kind of money design, and then talk about how that money design relates to democracy. So I'm starting at a bit more general level uh, here than the local, but we'll end up with the local, and then my fellow panelists will really dive into the local. Um, even more specifically. So each point, then a monetary design that goes with it, and then uh, a question about democracy. So first point, uh, money is a public creation. It's a form of public credit. There are lots of debates about what money is. A lot of those debates dissolve when you actually look at it historically and legally. We find out that most monies are a form of public credit. That's true from medieval coin to the modern dollar. It's really striking. Um, an example from our history. In 1861, the, the North and the South went to war. The Union had no money in its treasury, needed money, needed to invent money because it couldn't borrow and it couldn't tax fast enough. This is what it did. And this is the most basic money design I'm going to show you. I just wanted you to see the really an elemental logic of what the union did and what underlies basically the majority of uh, and all the sort of significant sovereign monies we have today. Um, the government issued IOUs, literally paid its soldiers with IOUs and then taxed those IOUs back. And the IOU said, this greenback is equivalent to one gold coin. If the piece of paper was the equivalent of one gold coin, then it had the value of one gold coin, voila, money right, in a very elemental form. And this logic is generalizable. So again and again, we see that what society, that societies run on the contributions of their members. In non-monetized worlds, that could be labor or resources that they give episodically. Time comes, say, uh, at wartime when, this, when the government wants to draft people before, um, before their routine contribution comes due. They draft them, they give them a token to show that they've already done their routine service that that person can give back when the routine service comes, comes along. So it's a kind of public credit. It can circulate in the meantime, right? Whoever's holding it can give it back. So this is the most basic money design. How democratic is it? It all depends on how democratic your government is, right? This could be set up by an autocrat. This could be a consensual system set up 
Um, and in fact, in, in the Civil War, an emancipatory system set up by the North where tax compliance was actually voluntary and was, was very highly um, uh, agreed upon. Uh, okay, so that's my first point. Second point, money, this kind of public credit can be made in different ways. Once we see that money is credit, we realize that credit can be configured in many different ways. Some are more and some are less democratic. You can see where I'm going with this, which is that we can redesign for more democratic or less democratic ends. So just to give you a sense of the variation, you could make money like this, basic money, government spends, government taxes, but you could you could require that it hold metal collateral, silver or gold collateral. That was medieval coin. Medieval coin was basically a different kind of credit form, it was still a credit form, but it had metal collateral. That meant, uh, that affected the way it could be minted, how much could be created. It also meant that if a government fell apart, people had the metal collateral left from the coin, right? So it was a different kind of theory about money and a different set of advantages and disadvantages. What I want to do now is show you the big design variation that brought uh, us modern capitalism, in my view. My book was a lot about this. Credit can also be made, can be configured indirectly. So in the previous slide, we saw the government spending directly, the greenback, taxing back. In this slide, also uh, an experiment of the Civil War, the United States, the North, gave long-term obligations to banks, groups of individuals. It established investors, it established as banks, chartered as banks, and then took the bank's promises to pay, spent those promises and taxed those promises back, right? A really interesting design variation. This is big, right? It's big for a couple of reasons. You can see that in this new world, the government would now be paying the banks for money. That's why I associate it with capitalism. Money becomes a profit earning enterprise. The other reason this is big is that banks can, another design variation here, can also make money for private individuals, not just the government. So here, private individuals give banks long-term IOUs, like a mortgage, an agreement to pay a mortgage. The bank advances them its own promises to pay. Those are, are spent into circulation and taxed back in, assimilated into the government system. So we have some some squirrely things with the US monetary system, which retail commercial banking came about before central banks, but leaving that aside, this is the basic logic, right? So another design variation, how democratic is it? That's debatable. So on the one hand, when we think about decentralization, it's an interesting point. The government is delegating in this new design variation, the power to make a public resource to individuals, right? Diffusing power to individuals, one can say this is decentralized, this is quite democratic. On second look, it's a little more problematic because what the government's doing is delegating to profit-driven actors, actors who will make money as it profits them uh, and empowering them to distribute a public resource. That becomes problematic when they um, make choices or insofar as they make choices that are only about their own profit as opposed to a broader vision of public welfare. To give you an example of how this design can go awry or be less democratic, again, we go to the Civil War period. Shortly thereafter, there were tenant farmers, impoverished farmers in the South and West who applied to banks for money. The banks denied their, their their application, even when they had collateral. So the banks were basically um, concerting power with merchants who were um, taking advantage of these tenant farmers. So, you know, in this case, we have a story about the anti-democratic operation of this money design. As one farmer who was left in debt peonage put it, um, the power of money has exacted from labor all that it produces except a bare subsistence, right? So it wasn't property, it wasn't enclosures, you know, these other famous things about capitalism. It was this money design that had excluded and shut down uh, agrarian development of, a, uh, of a, a basically just type. This leads me to the, the third point. So second point was, you know, credit can be made in many different ways. They can be more or less democratic. Third point where I'm gonna stop is we can redesign money. Once we see that it's a matter of design and we, we understand its designs, we can play with those designs to make it a more 
democratic medium. So the populace, those same impoverished farmers who had been shut out because of the exclusivity and dominance of the banking system came up with their own money design and it looked like this. So this was their idea for um, a just and democratic medium. They would put up their own agricultural produce as security, make long-term commitments to the federal government to repay and get advances from the government directly, right? Running around the banking system. A really interesting uh, um, innovation or elaboration of money's design, how democratic. I think this was strikingly democratic, right? This was the voice of poor and impoverished farmers who figured out, educated themselves about the monetary system, went to their elected representatives and asked for, um, for this new money design. Uh, it would have allowed them access to credit on a sound basis. It would have um, spread money and credit into circulation to allow more even um, uh, development and spread that public resource more evenly. We could update this kind of proposal. So now I'll get to sort of what we could do today, just briefly, to imagine that people made other commitments to their state or federal government um, of different types and were advanced money directly. Uh, that's a possible money design. I'll end with another money design that we're working with in Massachusetts, which takes as given the um, prevalence of banks. As I mentioned, this is, this is the money design that we use to do the vast majority of money creation in the modern, in the modern United States, and in fact, in the world um, uh, nationally. We could add, instead of only for-profit driven banks, we could add public banks. So in Massachusetts, our uh, legislation is um, proposes to add the state as a bank. The state, which normally charters private banks, would here charter itself to act as a bank, hold public revenues, and lend against those revenues. But instead of lending in a way that was driven by profit um, for shareholders, the state could lend with an eye to picking up those lenders who are currently sound lenders, good wor worthy lenders who are shut out of the banking system. Um, so right now that would mean underserved communities, uh, communities with different kinds of capital structure, land trusts, for example, that the Schumacher Center um, has been so innovative in, uh, in supporting and creating cities and towns, small businesses with different kinds of with slow growth plans um, and a variety of other borrowers. My point is, I'll conclude here, there are many different ways to design money. And in this brief tour, we've just looked at five of them. Um, we can continue to consider what these designs mean, how we could um, change them and redesign them now with democracy and local flourishing in mind. I'll stop there. Thank you for Christine. That's fabulous. Boy, I have a million questions for you, but I'm sure people in our audience will as well. Susanna, would you like to offer us some of your insights? Yes, of course. Uh, well, thank you uh, to the Schumacher Center for the opportunity to explain uh, my work. And, uh, and I'm really happy to be here with, uh, with all of you. Um, well, the fact I'm, I'm going to focus um, more uh, more precisely in one monetary uh, monetary design, which is the one that we have today, which is the bank money uh, design, which is uh, well, the, is based on the on a, on an exchange of IOUs, as uh, Christine has just explained. Uh, so uh, you go to the bank and you sign a, a credit contract, uh, a loan contract with the bank. That's how uh, well that's an IOU that you sign and the, ba the bank gives you an IOU, which is uh, bank money, is, is, is money uh, that is written in their, in their balance sheet and, uh, and you can use it to pay. And, uh, and the difference between these two, uh, these two I IOUs is that your IOU is not uh, accepted by anyone else, but the banks is because they have a license, a banking license. That's that's the way uh, modern banking uh, and modern money works today. Um, well, of course, the one of the main implications of this uh, of this kind of uh, monetary system is that uh, for something to happen, for something to be funded, 
there are two requirements. One is that it has to be useful for somebody. But of course, the other thing is that um, it has to make a profit for, for the bank, at least. Also, it has to make a, a profit for the for the company because uh, that is the, the requirement for, for sustainability in a business. But of course, it has to be it has to be also uh, an activity that provides um, that provides uh, uh, a good uh, a good uh, income for for the for the for the entity that is uh, financing this activity. This is um, this is something that um, is uh, makes this system undemocratic because Schumacher explains in uh, in Small is Beautiful that um that uh, you need to well for instance uh he advocates for intermediate uh, uh, technology a, a kind of technology that is adequate to the to the to the to the needs no this is something that um that can have a, a also uh to, to have a um a much more uh, human uh, face uh, of the technology well this is uh well this uh, would happen only and only if this um, technology is uh, actually uh, the one that is making more profit for for the for the for the bank, because otherwise, uh, well, other technologies will take the place of this technology. So mm, it doesn't matter that is socially unfair, that is uh, that is uh, environmentally unsustainable. Nothing of that is of any any. Um, importance uh in this situation because uh because what it really matters is that uh, it makes the most profit uh for 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 the for the finance so so this takes away the capacity of uh, of people deciding what kind of development they want how uh they want to make it those decisions are just out of the table, they, our democracy doesn't allow us uh, to take those decisions because that's taken in the finance realm. Um, okay, so what do we do? And now I'm, I'm gonna go uh, first to them. How how do we change this uh, this financial system, this monetary and financial system? Because actually. The, monetar the the financial system is the most important part of the monetary system that we have because banks are the ones who who create money so um uh, well we have of course and and we're going to talk here in this in this in this uh in this session about local currencies which is uh, something that um well Schumacher center is involved with the Berkshires um, I've been involved with it, uh, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about that, but also about other ways of changing the of, of uh, making uh, uh, of helping the evolution of the monetary system to happen, uh, which is something that is absolutely needed uh, to in order to 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 make a systemic change that may uh, be create an economy that is more focused on on that is uh, more focused on the individual on the on the society and uh, that uh, uh, prevents the 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 climate to 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 explode <laughs> let's say so um the first thing that uh, i'm going to talk about is the 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 local currencies and uh, i was involved in the rec experience the REC, which is stands for Real Economy Currency. Um, it was uh, created in collaboration with the municipality of Barcelona, which was um, which was uh, at the time. Uh, this was 2016-17. Interested in testing uh, a, um, a type of uh, guaranteed minimum income. Um, so there was. Uh, um, a group of people of families uh, that were given um, a top up on their current uh, uh, revenues. So whenever they didn't reach the minimum uh, consider basic for for their needs, uh, they were they were given by the city council an additional quantity to 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 be able to reach this minimum. 
And this quantity was given to half of them uh, in a 20% of it was given in, in a local currency that has had to be uh, spent uh, in the local economy. This is, uh, this is the, the experience of uh, Rec Barcelona. I'm gonna post in the, in the, in the chat um, some uh, documents that you can uh, that you can uh, that you can um, uh, review if you want um, the the some uh, scientific uh, articles that uh, we wrote about uh, about it. And uh, well, so but I'm I'm going so uh, the the idea with this currency in this case was that um, it was to promote the local economy. So to turn uh, an individual subsidy into a collective uh, subsidy of for the local economy, and the idea was to make the what is uh, make each uh, unit uh, each uh, currency unit. Uh, that it was put into this economy, in the local economy of Barcelona, of these neighborhoods, to make it work more for the community, to make it uh, generate more income for, for the community. So the aggregated income increased. So that's that was the that, that was the the interest of the of the, <clears throat> the of the promoters. Uh, and uh, that's uh, what we then tested by measuring the local multiplier effect of public spending and comparing it to the to the euro one so what we what you can see in these articles is that we 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 saw that in this particular case this was uh, this was true so it it really helped the the local economy to to make you know to use the money more times uh, in more transactions so in the end, uh, the aggregated income uh, created by these uh, money injections was was bigger than otherwise. Well, this is um, this is a way of um, trying to to not focus only on the profit of the market, on the on the market um, um, imperatives, but to 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 focus on the on the what is needed socially and. Uh, and this is uh, an example of uh, things that uh, can happen when you change the monetary design. As Christine was explaining before, the monetary design is everything that changes uh, what happens when you when you create money, when you spend money into circulation, when you also uh, lend into circulation, depending on the monetary design, of, of course. So. So this is this is um, uh, one example of of uh, what happens with uh, with the monetary design, um, and uh, but I think that this is not the only thing that uh, can happen. I mean, the the only um, the only way to change uh, the monetary system. I think that right now, and uh, as Eric was explaining, since two thousand and eight, there have been enormous changes in the financial system, in the monetary system, because basically it was bankrupt, totally. Um, the banking system had to be bailed out. And, uh, and uh, so there, there were huge changes at the time in, this, in those years that have uh, led to a new way of doing things, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, using, um, uh, well, the capacity of banks to buy to buy assets from the banks to to keep it alive, to keep uh, to be, to keep the banking system uh, alive, to to inject money into the economy, and and this is something that has been put into question a lot because uh, it actually changes a lot the distribution of income, so it has enormous distributional effects, and uh, and this has been called into question. Uh, and uh, of course, um, this is something that is, uh, and then we have something else, which is the, the climate crisis, which is also something that is making the monetary system and the financial system uh, is uh, making them uh, review, especially the public face of this, uh, this uh, monetary and financial system, which is hybrid. It's partly private, partly public. 
So the public part, which are the central banks mainly, are really uh, you know, focusing a lot in, in understanding how, uh, how banks can um, create, uh, you know, can uh, uh, prevent, can, can adapt to the, to the Paris Agreement, can uh, uh, adapt their activities to the to a, an economy that is uh, that is uh, socially just and uh, environmentally sustainable, and uh, and and this is something that is is happening, and uh, we are uh, in Europe uh, seeing how there is a sustainable finance uh, action plan by the European Union that is uh, you know taking uh, you know taking shape uh, and. Uh, and this is, uh, and basically, um, the idea is to um, to 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 tell the 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 banking system that um, they need to well that there is a a, a mandate of keeping a, fin a financial a financial uh, stability uh, in. So this means that um, central banks need to be looking into uh, how the financial system is uh, less likely to collapse, which uh, also uh, takes you to see what kind of assets are in, their, in the bank's balance sheet. And if these assets are likely to suffer from physical risk due to climate change, then, uh, well, the bank is in, in, in danger of, uh, of collapsing. So, so central banks have been called into uh, into uh, well, well, to to really monetize that uh, the assets that bank hold, and the ones that accept for uh, to guarantee their uh, their loans, um, are banks are, are are assets that are well fossil uh, free, for instance, uh, that are not uh, that are not affecting negatively the environment, and that th these uh, assets are not also affecting negatively. Uh, the risk that the bank is taking. So I think that though all those uh, ideas are there, uh, there's also the digital euro. I'm sure that uh, well, I'm sure <laughs> totally. I'm positive that uh, the, the the Federal Reserve is also looking into central bank digital currencies. Um, this is something else that will uh, change uh, again uh, the financial system. So financial system and monetary system are. Is evolving, and uh, and I'm I'm totally uh, mm, I think that this really needs uh, more democratic participation. All these changes, um, so I'm gonna post just a few uh, a few um, articles about the digital euro because there was there was a um, uh, there was a, an activity on the Beblin Institute in which you know some. Uh, some activists and academists um, were trying to figure out how the digital euro should be, um, for for um, you know for the good of people because uh, it, we, I think it, we, it's very important and this is uh, what uh, these uh, proponents were saying in this article that um, these changes happen for you know also with the participation of uh, of uh, representatives of the people directly not only from the financial institutions and uh, also we also uh, or, um, wrote an article about about the digital euro and how the design of uh, of monetary the, the monetary innovations that have taken place in 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 the realm of uh, complementary currencies have um, can be uh, something some experience that can uh, be uh, uh, can lead a little bit um, into into uh, new currency designs that can teach. I mean, these experiences can teach how how maybe uh, uh, a new uh, monetary and financial design can work uh, better for society. So I will leave it there. Um, I'm gonna post this on the on the chat, and uh, uh, and we can speak about it later if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanna. Yeah, this is so critical. The question of interplay between um, local and government and how that works. 
Will, can you take it away now and share with us um, a little bit about your work? Great. Yeah. Um, so thanks for having me. There's a, a long history with Schumacher Society, and I just I'm really thankful of Susan Witt and the team for helping us do petitions to get out of jail and guiding us along the path for about 10 years. So it's 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 been a it's it's been a journey and uh, we're still together. So. Uh, really happy about that. I'm I'm going to show a few slides here. So let me uh, let me jump into those real quick. Wow. Uh, do, 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 do. Share. Okay. Can you see that? Is that visible, guys? Give me a yes or no. 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 Not yet. We're just having a blank screen. Try again. Hmm. Interesting. It was working a second ago. It was. All right, I'm going to say stop sharing and I'm going to do it one more time. Share, allow, built in display, entire screen, share. Okay. Bingo, now we so, see. You see me. Okay, how about this now? <clears throat> Perfect, thank you. Visible? Okay, great. So um, I came to Kenya uh, back in 2008 and uh, I had studied the uh, Berkshires and a lot of other community currencies. I was originally a physicist that went into econophysics and then went into behavioral economics. And I was really excited with the work of Bernard Leotard and all this exciting stuff that was going on in terms of uh, the history of people innovating around monetary systems. And I loved agent-based modeling. And so I was, I was really excited to come to Kenya. I came with the Peace Corps. I learned Swahili. I fell in love and had a child, and uh, it's been home uh, now for about almost 15 years, I guess. And um, I uh, I began with a with a lot of the same models that uh, were being used that I saw in the U.S. And uh, I had videos of Bankos Palmas and Berkshires and and Delhi dollars, and I would show these to communities and. Uh, and kind of ask, you know, what what do you guys think of this? We, could you try this? What do you what, what what do you think? And we iterated through many many different designs. Um, some that were very successful, so much that the government got upset about them and uh, had to had to really um, battle with that for quite a while. Until to this day, where we've uh, we've grown. Uh, fairly exponentially. We work with over 80 communities in Kenya, um, over 60,000 uh, households have uh, been part of the programs. And uh, we've seen about uh, $4 million of trade in the network in, in uh, valued by the, the communities and uh, about a million transactions now using decentralized ledger. So we'll get into that. But what's really been exciting to me was, was the understanding of why these systems were working when they did work, and uh, and it really was kind of a learning, an unlearning of what I thought money was and what currency was. And so, here on the screen here, we have a Mwedia. Mwedia is a tradition of the Kikuyu tribe, and uh, here where I live on the coast, it's called Mwedia. But there's actually about 42 plus different names for the same tradition in Kenya for different language groups, and uh, and across all of Africa. And these are. Uh, in academia, they'd be called rotational labor associations. Uh, if you look up the you know early anthropology work of like mouse, these would be called uh, gift economies. And essentially, there would be a calendar of events over the years and different cycles of mueria. So the idea would be that uh, as a group, the community would um, make a commitment to each other. They would make a promise, essentially. And it would be in the form of um, emergency aid, uh, days of work for uh, during like the rainy season or after the rainy season, pre-harvest when people needed to build granaries. So this is a really just quick example here where you have three families. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details of assets and liabilities, but there was tracking of credit and debt in these situations. There was no currency, so to speak. There was accounting, though. And um, I saw one of the, the comments in the in the chat about that, and I think it's it's really true that we tend to fetishize money and currency, um, and certainly in Kenya it was a construct of imperialism that came in to dominate uh, societies. 
And uh, so what would it look like if we didn't have money? And so this is this is kind of where we've been going over the years and years here of trying to sort of deconstruct money. So in the first iteration, this family calls on the credit that they've been given within the community based on the promises that they've uh, committed and they're they're liable for supporting the other members in the community so they call upon the others to help them build this hut this is a, a granary um, everyone's bringing their resources and and just to to kind of think about it in this way there's this superpower here in the middle like everyone has excess capacity everyone has the ability to uh, share their resources with each other they just need a fair way to do it so this this family is calling upon the resources of the community and they're willing to to go into that as long as there is accountability right and so of course this this person this family is now in debt to the rest of the community they go and help the next group they go out and help the ne next group and we've reached a full balance of trade right so everyone is in balance and we've built assets and so this was the beauty of pre-colonial civilization was that communities were actively building huge amounts of assets together they were building houses granaries farms and they were doing it while they were building trust they were doing it while they were building human skills you know people would be involved so that really beautiful economics here so to me economics you know uh, the, the greek word is is uh, goes back to oikos which is management of the household and the household was the resources of the community and the word household or oikos in in swahili and a lot of bantu and across africa um is very common to use the word kaya. Kaya is a fractal-like word similar to the Greek oikos, which includes the sacred forest, it includes the home, it includes the society, and it really encapsulates all the assets, all the intangible assets as well of the community. Um, so, so these types of credit systems, you could call them that, um, they would enter circulation through medias, but they would also go into community projects, they would be supporting the elderly, and there would be forms of markets around them as well. And markets would be things that would pop up as trading surplus, like during weddings. They there was no market class, there was no market society. These were really uh, social markets or social economies. And there was expiration of these things as well. Like there was no such thing as a credit or a, a money lasting forever. That would be sort of an abomination. You would never have a, 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 you know, a promise that could last forever. And really, these things were essentially rotating promises. Or the term IOU works well, but can you ever have an IOU that lasts 10 generations? So permanent ownership of money or permanent ownership of anything was really, is really a modern construct. Um, it's not that modern. There, there. I, I would say actually that there was kind of two parallel societies always going on on the earth, at least, um, where there were empires of control and uh, more egalitarian and diverse uh, communities. So we can get back more into that later. But what was this looking like back then? There, there was this growth of uh, different types of human civilizations that was not ownership based. These guys were not building pyramids or, you know, uh, creating massive hierarchies, they were instead creating mycelial networks between them. Um, so uh, where does this live? Uh, the, the instrument itself in terms of the promise, um, that lives inside social agreements. Those agreements were really um, forms of holding commons. So uh, Eleanor Olstrom does a wonderful job of this. If you've never heard of her, you should definitely research her um, in terms of management of the commons. So if we imagine the commons of our commitments toward each other, right? That's an intangible commons, but it still uh, goes through all the Ostrom's principles in terms of how to manage the commons, which I'm not gonna go through. Um, that also lives inside a value system. So what are the values of the society that, that were being respected um, at the time? Um, I'm going to skim through this because I only have 10 minutes, but I, I, I want to just ping on promise theory of Mark Burgess. He does a really good job. He comes from computer science world and talks about how do we, how do sovereign people, sovereign agents, and he even goes to like circuit board elements, how do they work together to build trusted systems? And there's this sort of virtuous cycle of creation of promises, you know, that produce expectations. There's acceptance of them within a group or individuals, and then there's fulfillment of those. And that cycle is really a beautiful one. And we don't get to do it much as humans, not enough anyways. We've delegated 
trust and this kind of cycle out into uh, national currencies in in, uh, in a huge way. So communities are not making as much promises with each other. What's, what's happened, um, I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. Uh, I'm going to skip through this as well. Yeah, what, what's happened from, from early sort of endogenous systems that were from communities, we've gone all the way to fully exogenous systems, right? So like the, the banks, you know, they're not from within the community anymore the credit issuer, the medium of exchange, the unit of account is all exogenous. It's all from outside the individual and the community. Um, we, we have a lot of processes we work with in communities that we've sort of learned over the years from mostly uh, women selling tomatoes and uh, tribal elders who have figured out what worked in these situations. And, and usually what worked in a quote unquote community currency was communities that were practicing these much, much older traditions. They had a system of uh, coming into trust with one another. Um, it, we do a lot of games. We do a lot of, uh, you know, building and, and playing with the idea of how are we connected to each other? How do we map our assets with each other? Um, we, we use modern technology now uh, because we want to make sure that these things are not going to be on any sort of centralized ledger system, like a database that can just be shut off. So the more peer to peer the technology becomes, and this is you know one of the things from EF Schumacher and Small is Beautiful, like how do we create appropriate technologies to this? And I really, you know, there's, there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad in the distributed ledger systems like blockchain and whatnot. Um, We've, we've been using, we're actually part of the Celo network. And uh, so we're one of the servers that creates a ledger that enables people to use their, their regular phone. So they don't even need internet to use these systems uh, to start trading with each other. And um, I mean, there's, there's a lot to this, uh, these systems, there's built in expiration and demurrage in them. So there's no way to hoard them. The demurrage is, goes back into a community fund um, I wanted to show you this. This is actually live data of what it's looking like in the last month right now. So each one of these colors here is a different, we call them vouchers generally, but each community would call them what they, what they will. What they are is an expression of a promise, right? So this is, this is the promises of a community called Baraka. This is in a refugee camp. Um, in uh, in the north of Kenya. Actually, no, this one's in Kitui, which is in the central Kenya. Quite a few of these are in refugee camps uh, out here as well. So we have urban, rural, uh, and refugee camp kind of examples of this. And, and basically what's happening is people are expressing their value. They're expressing what they have to offer the community. And then there is a pooling of those commitments together. Um, and that's quote unquote, the currency in that it provides liquidity, it provides an ability for them to exchange and, and it gives them a credit amongst each other because their value becomes exchangeable for other people's value within the community. Um, so we can get more into distributed ledgers. This is what our team looks like. So we've got a, we've got a software team and we've got a field team that is uh, basically training trainers. And, and most of these, like this is Nadzua here, are women from local communities that learned how to do this stuff themselves and then started teaching other groups. So we've really just been spreading organically. That's starting to change. We're starting to offer a lot of these uh, trainings overseas. We've been working a bit in Mississippi recently and uh, a lot of other places too. So that's kind of exciting right now. Um, I, I was just in Mississippi and I was at a Best Buys and here is an example of a lot of businesses expressing their value. There's Starbucks and Taco Bell, right? And Burger King, they're expressing a promise for services. And here at, at, at uh, uh, Best Buys is a curation of those vouchers, right? It's a curation, in this case, a gift card, an IOU, a voucher, um, a gift card, a credit obligation are, are very similar types of legal instruments. And that's essentially what we're creating within the communities. They're creating their own expressions of value. So that when I was in this Best Buys, I asked one of the employees, where's your voucher? Can, can, could I uh, ask for your services? 
you know, where, how could I do that? And, and how can we have a system that makes these things exchangeable with one another such that we don't necessarily need a central or a single central currency, right? How do we create fully distributed and decentralized systems? And, and to me, that's, that's full actual democracy. And we actually do have the technology to do this right now. It's just a bit like explaining to someone, why would you use someone else's toothbrush? Why don't you use your own? Why don't you express your own value? And a lot of people do this already. And this is why I think it's really exciting to go back to these methods of creating pooled promises together is because uh, mileage plus miles is an example of that. Um, airtime credit, when you buy a, a subscription for your Vodafone or your, your telecom uh, a subscription, I mean, a, a bus ticket, right? There's so many forms of credit obligations. I mean, loyalty points, those are all forms of uh, expression of value. And that's happening already in your wallet. You probably already have five or six of uh, some form of credit obligation. So why can't we create a network across the planet, a mycelial network that connects all of this together and starts to disintermediate the national currency? And, and fine if, if you know, I, I've been watching Star Wars recently with my daughter, um, the Andor series, and, you know, the, the rebels versus the mercenaries, where the mercenaries, they, we all need money right now, right? We are surviving because we, you know, we've got to pay rent and food and stuff like that. So selling your voucher for dollars is also super a normal business practice. So like if, you know, Susanna wants to sell some consulting hours, she could in the form, in a similar form that could be poolable with all the other professors at her university, for instance, right? So there's a lot of ways in which we can actually start looking at organizations, you know, states, democracies as pools of expressions of value. And I think that is very close to what our ancestors were doing and it was probably how civilization formed it was you know how did we care for each other how do we actually build uh, cycles of trust with one another and this concept of money and currency i think has you know it's kind of been a fetishized we, you would never want one voucher to become a national currency right you wouldn't even want one voucher to become a regional currency necessarily you would want a network of them right so so if we can imagine that that's you know getting to to this vision so thank you very much i'm going to pause there oh thank you so much all of you for your sharing it sparks so many questions there's lots of questions in the chat i want to get to them um, but one of the things that we have done traditionally in the schumacher center and the society um is create opportunities like like when we create an opportunity like this of bringing thinkers and practitioners like yourself together to be in conversation with each other so that we can also witness that. And so I would really like it if you all could start the question and answer period by the questions and answers that you have for each other. And I am going to actually take um, a little bit of the time to ask you all a question and any of you could jump in on it as an example here. Um, for me, one of the critical things that you are all talking about is these different types of design of currencies, and especially how that can be held in the commons instead of being captured. And so my, my desire and my wish is that we had, as a common heritage, a grammatics of currency design. We actually knew what the grammatic components were that we could speak them into being in the same way that our verbal grammar speaks into being our coordinative ability to, to or our ability to um, understand each other in meaning. And so you both, you all three of you were speaking in my view, somewhat grammatically about these different ways in which money and this underlying thing that we call money, which is actually like, well, you're talking about is accounting comes into existence. Would any of you like to comment on the, on the possibility or the reaching towards a grammatics of what this is actually more deeply about, that if it existed, would then create this commons of being able to express these kinds of systems into being. I'll take get us started, maybe. Um, 
I think it's a really interesting question on two counts, both the idea that we should create a grammar and then the way you're connecting it to the commons. Um, so, you know, looking at money, conventional money, uh, as opposed to the, you know, I understood stood Will to say, look at all, look at our repertoire, right? It's much more creative and rich than we've, than we think it is. And we've gotten way too, um, we've reduced money to a certain set of, of, of types of relationship. Look at all the forms of credit we could have. So I tried looking at our reduced form, right, at money as I understood it um, in the modern world, in the medieval world, and looked for its design elements. And um, and what I came up with was that it was again and again debt, right? It's credit or debt. It's um, it's a mechanism that allows something to be transferred to travel between people, as opposed to just being an accounting between two people. It has a third a third party can get involved. And as a legal scholar, I'm really interested in how legal orders do that, how they enforce transferability or, um, you know, enable transferability. And the the last element that I think transfers to Will, it was interesting when I try asking your grammar question to Will's very different world of different modes of credit. The last element that I came up with was um, a pledge of value, some kind of value, right? Um, real value, material value. Uh, so I think that um, and then, you know, I wrote an article called Money's Design Elements that is this kind of grammar, um, an attempt to do that. I guess I would say one last thing about the commons. It is for me, and maybe this is partly because I'm a legal scholar, I'm actually not quite willing to dismiss the national government as hopeless and to dismiss larger networks as hopeless because I think we are embedded in them. We live in them. And that the, you know, in the best world, larger communities would still be communities, right? That governments would be communities um, with a different character, perhaps, and with different advantages and disadvantages to local communities. But local communities in the United States have not always been the kindest and gentlest and most romantic places for people to be. Sometimes national communities have been um, more emancipatory than local communities. So I think... You know, I guess I would throw back into the commons part of your question, the possibility that national monies and that that um, currencies made of political obligation, not only currencies made of our own expressions of value, can also function in ways that are interesting, important, liberating and and deserving of being reclaimed. Yeah, that's claims at all scales. Thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts or from Susanna or Will, or would you guys like to take away questions that you have for each other too? Um, Happy to jump in. Go ahead, Susanna. <laughs> no, I was just going to, um, to say that really, yeah. Um, 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 I think, I think uh, my, my understanding is that when you are... Um, working with a community currency when you have tried it when you have when you when you are involved in one you understand money much better than uh, when you are not that's uh, i think i think that's one of the most uh, important uh, outcomes of uh, working with money uh, uh, that that undertaking the you know the 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 capacity of, of I mean the the to, taking the responsibility of uh, creating the currency that you're going to use or at least one of them um, because of course you you need to use mm, the national currency because you have no choice but uh, but uh, at least if you undertake this this idea of using uh, um, a local currency, a complementary currency, a mutual credit system. This helps you understand immediately what what's going on, how it's um, how it's how money is created, and and this is a basic understanding for then be able to participate in these public debates of what's going on in the in the monetary and financial system, and uh, and I think that. Uh, uh, it, it's really important to uh, and and there was there was uh, not so long ago I read a paper about how important um, 
how it's uh, how the different paths that uh, the ECB and the Fed have taken regarding climate change and adaptation to climate to climate change and and this in this uh, in this um, uh, article they explain how well they are of course central banks are vulnerable and uh, uh well, i mean are influen influenced by by public opinion by um by lobbying by uh, many things and uh, when when uh, people express their opinions through organizations civil society organizations uh, that also influences um uh, uh, also even the central banks and uh, of course all the politics around it uh, and uh, i think that is really important that um that we uh, we try uh, that we do uh, undertake uh, you know the 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 taking uh, uh, creating uh, uh, complementary currencies is is key i think that's absolutely key and and proving that you can do it differently, that uh, it can work completely differently, differently if you do it differently, if you design it differently. But then at the end of the day, uh, I think it's also very important to influence uh, how the the, the national uh, currencies and the supranational currencies in the case of Europe uh, work, because that's where. Uh, where you're going to have a huge influence in 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 your daily life, and uh, so th that's that's mm, that's how I how I I uh, I understand this grammar of money is 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 a uh, is a grammar. I think it's is is a it, I think it's a process. It's a process of uh, process of understanding uh, what uh, money is. Uh, is doing into your life. I mean, is doing into your daily routine, and uh, and uh, what, uh, and then and then that that makes you able to understand how uh, the how the big talks um, influences you as well. Thank you. I could jump in there. Thanks, Susan. Um, I I. I want to go back to the, the, the term of the promise. And I, I think we've all kind of uh, mentioned the concept of debt and IOU. And, uh, and for me, the, this comes down to what is the promise, right? When I'm looking at a voucher, I'm looking at a credit or whatever the thing is, uh, money, I want to ask, is it promising? Is there a promise? Is there any sort of guarantee? Is there a commitment there? What is it? And so when I'm looking at the national government, and I'm looking at the dollar, I want to ask that question and I cannot answer it at all. There's no way for me to answer that question. And I, that to me is the most fundamental question. And if we can't answer it, we're in big trouble. And I, I also want to really make it clear that I don't think we're in a state run system. We are in at best neo-colonialist systems and and at worst neo-feudal systems we have oil barons and very wealthy people that are essentially running the planet to some degree right we don't live in a democracy in any way I, you know I, I i was just in mississippi and i was shocked i mean the the level of disconnect between people who are suffering and people who have capital and are using it to, to really make sure that no one else gets it is extreme right now. I mean, to me, the, the U.S. was is the boiling frog all over. Uh, it was it reminded me of why I left and uh, happy to go back and help. But uh, wow, um, happy to be back in Kenya as well. So I, I just, you know, like the, the system we're in is not a simple state system. And yes, wonderful if the state wants to express a promise and they want to say that their voucher is redeemable for some state services. Amazing. I would be so happy if the state said something like this and made it extremely clear what their promise was. And, and so this taxonomy of promises um, in schemas around, you know, how do we actually define what that is? How do we create attestation around this? You know, how do we create credit scoring? How do we create all kinds of, you know, uh, quantitative and qualitative assessment of these promises and how do we help them to work together to collateralize to pool 
right, to bring them into commons now, right? So as we come into commons together, we need to be clear. And, and to me, this is also part of open source, like the uh, Richard Stallman with Copy Left. The whole point is to make sure that there's due disclosure of what it is that you're offering, make sure that people can reproduce that thing. You would never sell a tomato where someone cannot replant the seed of the tomato, right? These kind of, off what is your offering, in other words? Is, is your offering something that you want to enclose or are we trying to create unenclosability, right? It's something that Art Brock, I love to say. And I, and I, you know, so I love a lot of the work of Holochain and the decentralized ledger world is about trying to reach unenclosability. And if the state wants to operate within that as well, beautiful, beautiful. We're not trying to be anti-state. In fact, we are trying to bring in all the mercenaries and consultants and uh, anyone who needs dollars and say, here's a way to divest your dollars and invest into utility, into actual real promises that you can measure that you can actually be part of as well. So th to me, there's a beautiful opportunity there. We're working with hundreds of coconut farmers that want to pre-sell their coconut oil in the form of a promise, in the form of a voucher, right? Beautiful way to help that community here in Kenya. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Will. I appreciate that. Right. That goes right to the heart of what I'm doing in Holo and Holochain, which is we're trying to produce a promise of hosting and have a mutual credit currency that is backed by the productive capacity of web hosting. And the underlying technology is meant to do that in a decentralized way. So I think we're we're talking the same language. Do you, do the three of you have questions for each other that you would like to ask before we dive into the many that are coming from uh, our attenders? Can I just try connecting our worlds a little bit? Um, you know, the national world, the world in Mississippi that Will hated and and the credit conversation. I, I mean, I actually think that when I said banks are the beginning of capitalism, I meant it. I meant there was a world in which we could imagine promises being more transparent that was hijacked when or was obscured when when the government, when this, when nation states in that moment create, you know, delegated their power to create a, a public resource to banks, to for-profit actors. And, and, you know, a huge amount of the obscurity and alienation that has followed, I think is due to that decision, right? And to the monopoly that banks have and shadow banks have now on money creation. So if, if we wanted to, it seems to me really important to try to recapture what money is, if we think about, about those designs, you know, some are quite direct. The, the community can be big or can be small, but but the question is, how are we actually making promises and how are we fulfilling them? Is the question, I mean, we'll ask the right question. I just think that it's not, I don't think it is neo-feudalism. I think it's capitalism that we live in. And I think it's capitalism because of this monetary structure. And the monetary structure is one that makes indirect and obscure the promise. Right. And that and that gets um, amplified by disciplines like economics that put money in a black box and don't explain it. So making it more and more inaccessible to everyday kind of understanding. So to go back to Susanna's point about complementary currencies, and I think this is also related to Will's point, you know, we'd learn we learn a tremendous amount if we actually have to, if we go experience and excavate money for ourselves or promises of value, credit, circulating credit, how, you know, we could. We can discuss the vocabulary, but I think there's something in common here that we're grasping towards. Um, and I am I would emphasize that we need to kind of keep, keep um, targeting the national monies as well as local monies to figure out what's happening here and to be able to reclaim them, right? To be able to recapture and know what's going on because we have to work at all these different layers if we're going to succeed. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly why I was trying to get at commons, where the capture is of this capacity, which is which I'm hearing here is this whole desire to take the capacity and put that back into the commons instead of having that be a captured monopoly. So that's why I was using that language in my question. Any other questions for each other? I, I have a quick one for the two of you. Um, I. I, I focus a lot on demurrage and, uh, you know, the idea is that there's a externality of hoarding money um, that, you know, if, if you read Piketty, for instance, you know, he would say the collection of capital exponentially increases 
uh, inequality because the growth on capital, you know, whoever has it ends up with, you know, if there's any positive rate of return on it, it ends up being a percentage or exponential. And so you create inequality. So capitalism, in a sense, fuels a form of feudalism where very few people end up with all the power. Right. So, you know, it, it's a natural algorithmic effect that there would be a Bill Gates in the system. There would be families that end up owning everything. And maybe that's not quite feudal, but it, it is it's certainly not free market capitalism as we might sort of laissez faire imagine it. Um, and so this concept that there ought to be a tax on hoarding. Right. Which is essentially a demurrage. We call it an expiration as well here. So when your vouchers expire, your promises, they expire, you know, quantitatively, their value doesn't go down. So we're not causing inflation. The, there's a there's a fixed supply here of your promise, um, but you can't hold it forever. Right. So if the Red Cross does this, for instance, they're buying vouchers from a, a village and they're redistributing those to uh, refugees, for instance. So the, the village ends up as the aid vendor and they're creating an economy there. And it's really nice. If the Red Cross were to keep those vouchers, well, eventually they would be taxed back into the community anyways. Right. So this this idea of, you know, for us, we've also consider this type of well, Gessel taxation or demurrage back into basic income as a, as a way of providing you know tax redistribution, right? How does that actually go out into the community? So I just love to hear what you guys think about that. And because to me, there's that there is something fundamental about capitalism in, in terms of that we have the right to own capital, right? Specifically money forever, right? Like that, that, that we as a society believe that is, is a big thing. Yeah, over uh Susanna do you want to go first or I can also uh, go yeah uh if you want um I, I I just um yeah I think um that um well demurrage is uh is uh, something that um can can be uh yeah a way of uh of income it's a it's a is a is a way of taxation and uh and it's uh and it's a way of uh you know preventing uh preventing uh the hoarding, but uh, I think the, that sometimes it's uh, I think it's overrated sometimes because most of the, the hoarding in the capitalist system is not made in, for, in the form of cash, is made in the form of assets. So if you look into a very wealthy person, I don't know Bill Gates, I guess that I don't think he has a lot of cash in the bank. He's got a lot of assets. And those assets are not are not money, uh, are not uh, liquid. Uh, are you know in the form of uh, properties, companies, uh, you know, patents. Uh, so so this hoarding uh, is not totally related to to hoarding of uh, of cash, and uh, and so 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 in my view. It is very important for this purpose of uh, of uh, avoiding uh, hoarding um, to have uh, different types of uh, money and uh, and uh, and uh, in, in when I when I wrote my book uh, back in 2011, I I explained uh, two types of money. One is seed money, which is the one that is you know created. And this normally should go to productive activities, and those productive uh, productive activities that are socially sustainable. And then you have um, uh, uh, a kind of money that is like a harvest money, which is the money that you have received for doing something uh, or for uh, the product that you've created. And that's uh, that's uh, that's something different. Uh, we use just one kind of money, which is when the, when the harvest money, when when you have uh, created uh, a product or service, or and you sell it in the market, and you get some uh, some savings because mm, you are able to 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 get more income than than your costs are, then uh, that's what you use to then invest in something new, invest in improving, uh, in, in enlarging your company. And then you you sell it to the market, 
and and you get a profit in the form of interest rates and is this just one kind of money and i think that's uh, that's ridiculous um that i i think we don't work like that anymore because banks create money out of uh, thin air and with the with the, and the and central banks also agree with that because uh when there's a, a need you don't need to to first save anything for to be able to make an investment that is socially interesting um so we don't work like that anymore, but somehow that's the idea. And that's what uh, Will was explaining. Of course, if there's only the money that is around, then uh, then hoarding it is 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 a huge uh, is a is a huge creator of inequalities. Um, whilst when you are just you 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 can just uh, issue new money whenever you need it, which is what we do now, but for the wrong reasons. So we do it because we need a 2% uh, uh, inflation rate and we don't have it, for instance, a few years ago. Uh, or we, uh, So we are investing in anything, whatever it is. Whatever it is that uh, is creating economic activity, yes, that, that, that will do. No, of course not. That doesn't do. I mean, that's how you create a, a, an economic system that is nothing, uh, is, is not what you want. Um, so I think that, uh, this, I think this is something that this way of, uh, of creating money for, for solving needs is something that needs to keep happening. Uh, but we have to get rid of the logic that is still embedded in, in our minds and on using this money system in a way that is not how it is meant to work because, it doesn't work like that anymore. Um, so, 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 for instance, uh, why do you receive a loan? Because you're credit worthy, so you you have the money already. So you receive a loan because you have money. Okay, so uh, a loan should be for somebody who who is not, who doesn't have the money. So another other other uh, criteria for allocating money is needed. And. Uh, Another way of supporting, uh, you know, the the risk is 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 needed. We have reached the agreement that um, the well, we've reached the, the 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 point in which it's clear that the the ultimate uh, responsible of credit is is the taxpayer because that's who, that taxpayer is the one who bails out the bank when when it cannot uh, uh, fulfill their duties. Well. Then why uh, why credit allocation is not uh, following that that uh, principle? I well that's yeah. uh, I think that's uh, just to enrich a bit uh, the focus on 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 mm-hmm. on, um, on on hoarding uh, of capitalism uh, because I there's a lot of uh, I think there's a lot to talk about on that. Thanks, and that ho- that <laughs> also. Um, gives us a little bit of answers to folks who were asking in the chat about uh, Demirage. So we, I hope that that's serving some of the, the questions that were there. Christine, you I, wanted to comment I, on yeah. this. I just, I think Demirage is a really interesting question. And if you think, if you think money is credit, which I think it is, it clearly is, then credit can expire, right? A promise can inspire, expire. And, um, and in fact, there've been a bunch of monies that expired. Uh, I, I'm sure in Will's experience, but also in mine. So, you know, looking at old monies in the 18th century, made in um in different provinces sometimes those monies expired which which would totally change the incentive for how we moved money around and how we spent it and we lost that um we learned how to roll it over we learned how to roll it over and and, and there should be a debate about whether it's good or bad right to roll it over but let me just add one thing to connect accumulation to cash which I think it, cash that doesn't expire which I think it um it does today and that is you know, in in those maps I was showing, it's when the when the government, the biggest stakeholder in the community, puts a long term promise with the with a bank. Originally, the Bank of England was the first big experiment this way, and takes money in return. It then has to pay interest on that long term debt, and that becomes an asset that that uh, wealthy investors can hold. 
And that's new, right? We didn't have assets held by long-term investors, even in the medieval England, Italian city-states, right? So we, you know, transferable long-term debt that's circulating is the flip side of banked money creation. And it's financial assets on which people are accumulating such huge fortunes, right? Some of them are productive, but it, we more and more we see the division, but you know, the way that financial assets are loosed from the productive economy. So I think, I think cash does, and the kind of cash we make connects directly to long-term assets, financial assets that allow people to accumulate huge fortunes, and that these are part this part of the whole architecture that is you know, that is at play when we're talking about capitalism. Capitalism for me is not a free market. There's never been such a thing as a free market, right? It's created by the kinds of money designs we're making and we're making one that is allowing a, a huge amount of accumulation in long-term financial assets. Thank you. I think that's a really brilliant insight about the way the monetary system creates the market. It's so, that's such a crucial thing. Um, so there are a bunch of questions in the um, chat that are about a question about how currencies relate to ecosystem services and bioregional assets and how there might be actually currency designs that are about increasing and hoarding that kind of value and generating more of um, the value of the ecosystem services. And could you, would any one of you like to comment on that as it pertains to currency designs? Can I pose this in terms of a question to Susanna? <laughs> I, I mean, this is, I, I don't know the answer to the questions that the people are asking, but she was so on the mark talking at the beginning of her remarks about the fact that profit-driven money creation by banks means that banks will continue to fuel fossil fuel in the industry, right? And so we have a real, you know, we can say many nice pieties, but, in, but until we move money creation, until we find a way um, to pluralize or to restrict that system by banks, they're going to keep funding the fossil fuel industry. So I was curious to hear her continue to talk about that. And maybe it gets at some of the um, questions that the users are, the um, participants are asking. Um, well, I think, uh, well, uh, to, to answer first, uh, uh, Christine, uh, the, um, the, there's, uh, there are two things. There is the, um, there's the capital requirements, for instance, um, that, well, there's uh, the macro prudential uh, policies that are, uh, are um, being, um, being uh, handled basically by the Bank of International Settlements in, in, in Switzerland. That's, uh, that's um, and also the G20, the Financial Stability Board, those they are setting up the the the, the macro prudential rules which means um what uh, everybody well all the banking system needs to do to keep the stability of it and uh, and uh, and and of course the capital requirements that were increased after the financial crisis and those have been changing and also there is the uh, the disclosure requirements so they have to they have to say what uh, they are financing um and the risk they are undertaking and uh, and so so right now there is a lot of pressure in 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 getting the 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 the, the, the central banks the the, the macro prudential rules to 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 increase capital requirements for fossil fuels because they're creating uh, an additional risk that uh, they should be they should be um, you know backing. So that's that there was there was um, there was a campaign by fin Finance Watch, which is an organization that is uh, that is advocating for uh, for uh, for the change of the monetary and financial system and. Uh, and this campaign was one for one, one, one dollar for one dollar. So if you lend to fossil fuels, you need to have uh, one dollar of capital requirements. Um, so, but uh, you know, this is one of the ways. And the other way is 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 about um, 
the you know labeling the your 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 uh, your uh, your your assets uh, and uh, that's how um, there's all the ESG uh, ESG rating so so depending on what you are lending to you have uh, you have a, a a label in in the in the asset that is in your in your uh, as a bank you have an asset in in your balance sheet and uh, and the idea is that um, you have to then uh, turn your your balance sheet into a, a balance sheet that is uh, sustainable. So your activities have to be sustainable and have to be um, have to be uh, according to to the rules of uh, ESG. Well, this is this is the theory. So we'll see how how this works. Um, is uh, for now is still. There's still the rules of ESG, so uh, environmental, social, and governance requirements. So, what's supposed to be sustainable assets, the rules are being decided right now. So, um, and and uh, so and there is a lot of uh, controversy around it because, of course, all the greenwashing is based on changing. I mean, calling something green when it's not. And, uh, but uh, that's, I mean, is, is the, that's, I think that's one of the issues that can help um, push the, the banking system in a different direction. Um, so that's, that's uh, regarding um, what the question of Christina, I don't know if I, I, I answered, but uh, that's, uh, that's a bit uh, the, um, the what, uh, what's going on in that field. And um, and uh, sorry, I, I, can I, can you repeat, Eric, the the other question? Um, I think I'm going to leave that one to go to give a chance for another question. We're okay. like getting close to the end of our time, but there's so much energy and so many questions. I apologize, we're not going to be able to get everybody's question, but I do want to offer. I want to ask one question here because it's focusing on the t the theme of the um, uh, of the conversation. This notion about democratizing money creation. And we've been there in a lot of different ways. But here, Tom Woodruff is asking the question. He says, I am missing in the conversation the way that a really significant portion of the broader measure of money is created by small businesses in the form of trade credit. This highly democratic, everyone's allowed to do it. And it's an it's an IOU in the reverse, a UOI. So it's a huge, it's democratic, and it's unrecognized. And so this is the question for the three of you. Do you have thoughts about how this could be brought into play to support desirable, equitable, and ecological outcomes? And how, to me, that's a, a question of um, currency design. Anybody want to take that one? Sure. Yeah, I can jump in there. So I, even kind of combining the last question, what we've been working a lot with is uh, uh, farmers and uh, people offering environmental services to create um, an expression of that promise that they are doing this. And we've been partnering up with a with a group called Green Stand, and they have an app called the Tree Tracker. And basically, they can over time track the growth of these trees that they've been taking care of that produces metrics which can go out to uh, any sort of organization like the the un for instance that has essentially kind of like taxes that are being redistributed toward those activities so there's there's a promise to do the service there is a promise to pay for the service but there's a missing bootstrap right because people need money right now to actually get started to do a lot of environmental services right so both sides of you know supply and demand are essentially there but there's no bootstrap to get the supply started right <clears throat> and so that's a big big uh, problem and so offering um to bootstrap that is 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 a big deal and so that's a big thing that we've been doing with capital raising again using these forms of vouchers can we pre-sell those services to start that service going, knowing that we have a buyer already, like the Global Climate Fund, for instance, and there, there's so many, you know, funds out there that are willing to, to put in that. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, this idea of a, uh, a trade credit, um, for me, it starts with the, the promise. 
And then it goes into pooling those promises in terms of attestation, making sure that they're creditable, making sure that there is collateral around them and creating that market around them. So I really like, you know, the, the concept of independent trade credit. Um, I, producer credit is another term that that comes to mind that's that's been popular in the past. And uh, I, I to me, I think that's the answer. I think it's, you know, like the, the socialist debate or the socialist calculation. It was very hard to do something like this in the past to have a global database or decentralized databases that would be immutable and trustworthy to actually hold. Like I imagine this is like the refrigerator analogy. It's like if you open your refrigerator and you look at all the ingredients in your refrigerator and you say, what could I make with that? That's, that's where we could be right now. And, and I think, you know, if we think about Starbucks gift cards as a form of money, well, we're, we're already on the way there. Right. We, you know what I mean? Because anyone could do that and it's legal as well. And so that's what's, you know, that's why we're not in jail because it is legal for people to create vouchers and create IOUs. So, uh, so loving that concept. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with uh, Will uh, said. I think that uh, we have so much technology and uh, all this technology can lead to understanding much better what kind of debt uh, anybody is issuing. Uh, so that could lead to a homogenization of, uh, of the kind of debts that are around. Uh, companies are creating debt, of course. And, uh, and this technology is not, uh, I, I don't see, um, I mean, there, is, there, is, there are uh, very, very interesting initiatives, but, uh, um, but actually, I mean, this is a huge part of community, uh, compl sorry, complementary currencies, which is the, the, the trading, um, the, the, the barter systems. These are huge, this, uh, the, the community uh, that, that, uh, that uh, take, uh, that uh, under, uh, take uh, create a, a currency unit to trade among each other. And, uh, and, uh, and I'd like to see much more technology put into understand, and, you know, uh, making it uh, um, uh, much more understandable for people uh, to, to, really, to really operate with this, with this kind of, uh, of, uh, of systems and understanding what's the debt behind it and, uh, and uh, giving it a, a much more reliability thanks to that and much more uh, uh, a much more uh, wide being much more widespread great thank you so much well i think we're um, reaching a little bit of the end of our time there were a bunch of questions and the questions uh, around um, and this is where we're getting to now at the end of your uh, your comments here about the technology that's available. And so we had a bunch of questions about blockchain and about Ethereum and are they going to be uh, available in tools for us. Um, and we also had some questions um, about uh, here. The this question I think is is a fun one. It says. Um, I think there's far too much far too much attention and money given to theoretical work when practitioners like Will are being held back through lack of support. And so it's it's interesting to me the the implementation the tools the underlying infrastructure questions versus the theoretical grounding for ho holding those tools. And so I'm trying to unite these questions that I'm getting here into a comment between the balance of those things theory and practice and do you all have a comment on that? And I think I'm going to take this as the last set of questions uh, if each of you um, want to answer about that and then we'll have some closing remarks. Anybody want to take that on the balance of of tech and and theory and what you how you feel about that? I, I guess I would say I'll get get us started maybe. Um, I think that theory informs practice and also holds back practice in a million ways. So I don't think one can be discarded um, for another or displaced by another. Um, and my own in my own area, it feels like theory, it, it, you know, trying to figure out how money is designed is constantly deflected by the current reigning paradigms in economics. And, and my guess is that those reigning paradigms in, in economics make it impossible for Will to get much money, <laughs> right? So I, I think these are related. I think the more we can open up the space, 
I mean, it's a, you know, I don't know which one comes first, but I think there have to happen mutually, right? That, that we have to have practice trying to break the ice and we have to have theory trying to break the ice because otherwise they inform one another in ways that can be really exclusionary. Um, yes, I think also that um, um, we were talking about uh, technology uh, that uh, that can uh, help um, uh, have a, a better systems uh, of uh, of exchange, and uh, and this technology, of course, ha somebody has to do it. And uh, like uh, the intermediate technology that uh, Schumacher was proposing is uh, well, if uh, if nobody's going to make a huge business out of this then but maybe nobody does it so uh, so um, I think this is something that uh, it's only uh, possible if there are systems that are working in the ground and they are needing this kind of uh, of um, uh, features in the in the technology they use for their for their money systems and if this is getting developed somehow uh, at a practical level so uh, so that when something is possible uh, then because the, the, somebody has made it already then then you you then are able to 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 change the theory to to change what's what's going on in the market and and what what's possible and what's not possible so i think it's totally um, complementary one with uh, with the other it's uh, it's necessary to have uh, to have uh, to have um, grassroots initiat initiatives uh, and uh, also to to have some gra grassroots mix with uh, local authorities initiatives that can push what the what the state of the art in in this regard and and make evolution uh, make it evolve. Thanks, guys. Yeah. I, I, there was a quick question there before this around uh, blockchain and whatnot, and we, you know we've we've been working with decentralized led, ledger since I think 2018 now, and uh, we've gone between different four different versions of them, different different blockchains, and uh, finally we found one that we could be part of, and you know this idea of peer to peer like that everyone should ideally be part of the infrastructure if they can right like ideally you would the, the tools you're using are something that you could actually reproduce and be part of and i think that's even the goal of holochain and i've been you know waiting i think 15 years for holochain so i'm excited about it as well but um so there are there are some good decentralized ledgers out there you know cello blockchain right now so we're part of that network which means that if we go down uh all the information will still be there. And also if they if they all go down, we can still maintain the network as well. And it also means that uh, no one that uses these systems has to pay for the gas because we have an automatic way to make sure that everyone has uh, the ability to use the system. So that's been, you know, like the the, the question around technology. I mean, we're, we're hardcore copy left, you know, AGPL3, you know, Richard Stallman type uh, ethos, you know, knowledge common. So I think that's really important. And um, on the, on the pract practitioner side, I would just say that if we had gotten a bunch of money way back when, I wouldn't be here. Um, probably it would have actually made us worse and slowed us down because we didn't have money we had to actually innovate and work in the field and make sure that we're offering a real service because otherwise we'd be stuck paying 10 to twenty thousand dollar salaries to a bunch of europeans and americans and we obviously like our entire operation runs on maybe ten thousand dollars you know so uh the fact that we we could we had to do it as bare bones as we possibly could made it such that it had to work. And so we offer services and we have a voucher as well for our services. And that's how we're interacting with um, our, you know, uh, clients like the Red Cross and World Food Program, but also community groups and, and you know, groups in other countries and whatnot, in terms of we have a voucher redeemable for our training, right? We have a voucher redeemable for our digital services as well. And ideally uh, we can train you to reproduce those digital services as well. Like we don't want to be the, the node that does it all. Like these are protocols, right? They're schemas, they're taxonomies that we all need to start learning and using. 
and yes, not everyone's going to be a programmer and run servers, but ideally the technology is getting to the point where it's, it's more and more simple. Eventually it just runs on your phone. You know what I mean? Like even the, the ledger itself, you know, so that's, that's the pie in the sky we've all been hoping for, for a long time. So I hope, I hope that's the case. And, uh, and, you know, as, as these things grow, let's, let's see them growing horizontally and, I, we've seen lots and lots of big businesses try to sort of capture the community currency market and whatnot. And um, it hasn't worked out very well. And I think probably because there's some missing principles there. And uh, and in some cases, you know, like there some companies like, let's say, Stroholm in, in the Netherlands, they, they were very early on in the scene and they early on they kind of locked people into licenses and stuff like this so you couldn't use other systems and there's all i mean they've changed a lot over the years they, they have a wonderful product as well called cyclos I, I i would recommend looking at it as well there's a there's a lot of tools out there we have one called serafu.network now that we're starting to just put those taxonomies like you can go in there and publish a voucher simply right you can do that as a group you can do that as an individual and then there's the beginning of being able to now pool those together with things like uniswap and other types of liquidity uh, provision um so that's you know we're still on the beginning of that of course it would be super i mean the, the most expensive thing is tech is is uh, programmers are expensive and luckily we've got a, a few really wonderful volunteers um but that is the biggest thing is is paying for um just building open source technology. Not many people want to build copy left technology because you can't, it's very hard to profit on it long-term, right? Unless you're offering that as a continue. So our services are, so one, you have to build the stuff and then you have to actually offer services because you're not going to make money from enclosing the tech. And so there's a lot of licenses out there that say they're open source, but they're not really, they, they end up like the, the Google licenses like Apache 2, they, they're open source until they make a modification and then they're closed source, right? And so you end up, you know, uh, commodifying the knowledge commons through different types of licenses. So anyway, there's lots of, lots of topics there and it's, it's been lovely to, to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Susanna. Um, I want to give you each the opportunity for two minute closing remarks. You've heard a lot of, from each other. There's been a lot of questions. This has been great. Maybe we'll go in the exact same order that we started in. Um, so if you can just give us a couple sentences, a couple minutes of closing remarks for um, this incredible conversation that I'm, I'm so grateful that you're helping to hold and build on. Christine. Um, Christine. I guess I would um, bounce off the last question that you asked, which was about theory and practice with a pitch for people to try to understand the credit regimes in which they live. Um, for a lot of, of us, that's, I mean, for almost, for basically all of us, that includes modern money to try to understand what it is and how it's made so that we can redesign it. And the second part of that pitch is there are these uh, movements across the world, uh, whether it's local currency or in the case of the movement I'm involved in, public banking, that are attempts to, um, to rethink and redesign. And I think we have to, um, we have to all uh, try and experiment at that level in order to, um, to reach a more democratic medium. Thank you. Susanna. Sorry, um, I will uh, just, uh, I don't want to make it more, lo uh, more longer. Um, I think this is important. I will encourage everyone to, to, to try, try new, new ways of uh, exchange value um, and uh, use the knowledge for, uh, for deciding uh, for participating in in what uh, what's going on in the in the in the political scene of money as well. That's all. Thank you. And will. Yeah, I I guess it's just uh, encouraging everyone to put on that hat of looking for promises, looking for what is promising in currencies or vouchers or 
any sort of monetary system and also to express your own. And I know many yoga teachers who make subscriptions, right? That is a form of a promise that you buy. It's a, you give them a production loan, you give them money, right? And eventually you use that subscription. Gyms do it. Um, all kinds of people can do this. And I think if we start putting ourselves in that frame, it's a, it's a beginning. If we can all express our promises, if we can, if we can do that, there's this opportunity for us to now start combining them in, into, into markets that actually don't depend on the US dollar, right? The US dollar can be there too. That should be a promise itself, right? So I really, I really just wanna encourage people to start thinking about how they can express their own time and their own commitments uh, in the form of a, a promise for consulting for hours, for you know, dollars worth of your time, that, what, what, whichever way you do it, however you sell your current labor to the market, if you can sell that in a way in which you are an equal service provider now, if you're a factory worker, you are selling your time, your services to the factory owner. It's a change of relationship already. And when we pull those things together, that's when we build this, what I call a uh, economic commons. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, all the three of you, for holding such a rich conversation, for helping bring forward this thing that I think is actually critical, like deeply, it's existentially critical, quite frankly, in my, my point of view. And so the, the depth and the breadth that you are holding with this is a gift. It's a gift to us. And thank you all who participated. I apologize for how difficult it is to get the questions answered. We have a lot to learn in the world about how to have conversations that um, bring more people in and yet steward time and create focus. There's a lot of complexity to that. And as such, the other thing that I would like to do is remind people of the next panel conversation, which happens on Thursday, October 19th. Um, and it is on the theme of rethinking ownership and work shared responsibility and reward. You can look for more information about that and registration on the Schumacher Center's e-newsletter, social media, and of course its website, uh, schumachercenter.org. So thank you. Thank you all for joining us and being part of this great conversation. Greatly appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.